Hey, it's Mike here, and today my response to John Oliver's very recent video titled The Next Pandemic. There was so much good information in it, and he teed it right up to present some great solutions. It's estimated that up to 75% of new or emerging infectious diseases come from animals. And then he just totally whiffed it. Him and presumably his writers of the show last week tonight straight up dismissed what I'm going to argue is the single greatest prevention strategy for the next pandemic that we have. I'm gonna present a bunch of research and data as to why I believe that to be the case. Links will be in the description as always, and leaves are in the back. I need to <laughs> fix them again, and let's go. Let me start by saying I really like John Oliver's show. I think it has a great track record and has done an amazing job of spotlighting some social issues such as the mistreatment of Uyghurs in China, etc. They just finished a long season break and they came back with this video as their first video. They clearly view it as an important topic and I view it as an important topic too. I have a video clip on TikTok from months back that is titled, the exact same title, The Next Pandemic. And where they really hit a bunch of good points is that pretty much the whole video is focused on zoonotic or animal derived diseases that jump to humans. They got so much good information on that in there. He drew the connection between farm animals and deforestation and more, but when it got to him throwing out solutions, this is where I majorly face palmed. Here he is. Which brings us to the obvious question, how do we stop doing that? Well, the most effective way would be to close down all wildlife markets, ban factory farming, stop eating meat altogether, halt deforestation, shut down all state fairs, and definitely take away Paris Hilton's kinkajou. But obviously, none of those are going to happen. He didn't even take the classic position of maybe eat less meat or go a little further by saying eat as little meat as you can, things that would probably be expected from somebody like him. People won't give up meat, so oh well, we'll just let that be. This is kind of like if there was a bunch of forest fires and Smokey the Bear was like, oh well, people just like setting fires, they like throwing cigarettes out the window, so there's nothing we can do. Maybe we can increase fire reporting, just like how John Oliver was saying that it's great that we can increase reporting of sick animals like they are in Thailand and other band-aids like that. We'll talk about the limitations of those bandages toward the end, but first I just really need to emphasize why our decision to eat and use animals and really create animal agriculture in general is our next big risk for the pandemic. You know, this is the combination between the direct effects of animal agriculture as well as the effects on wildlife. And speaking of wildlife in the case, of SARS-CoV-2, which leads to COVID. And as we will discuss, the most likely candidate is a wild animal that people were trafficking and eating for their meat. But throughout history, the main pandemics appear to be a direct result of domesticated animal interaction. Wild animal usually isn't the case. It wasn't the case with the ducks that created our lethal flus when we domesticated them. Natural forms of the flu are not lethal. Incidental wild animal contact certainly wasn't the case for the cows that originally gave humans measles, the sheep or pigs that gave humans whooping cough, the water buffalo that gave us leprosy, the cows that probably gave us strep throat, the camels that are the most likely culprit for smallpox. The strain that gives us smallpox appears to have diverged from camelpox around 6,000 years ago. Also for sure, the camels that gave us MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, a coronavirus which demonstrated a 35% case fatality rate or the civet cats that are eaten as a delicacy in Asia that gave us SARS-1. And yeah, they're technically wild. They're still part of animal agriculture as they're bred on farms. Or the pigs that gave us Nipah virus, which has a 75% known case fatality rate. And there was a 2018 outbreak in India. Eek. It also isn't the case with the new vaccine resistant strain of SARS-CoV-2 from the Dutch mink farms, which hopefully was snuffed out. Let's keep our fingers crossed, but I have a whole video on that if you wanna watch. I think you're getting the point. In all these cases, people's use or direct eating of these animals was detrimental. And there's one figure I think that illustrates how this is gonna continue to be an issue if we don't change our ways. And that is from this study, which compared wild mammal biomass to domesticated mammal biomass. And the wild ones are now outnumbered by domestic ones by 15 to one. There's so many variables to this, but just in terms of raw animal numbers, we're talking about like 15 times the risk of that new strain being developed in farm animals instead of wild animals. And in terms of all types of land animals, we are raising and slaughtering roughly 70 billion per year. So that's 70 billion animals that are likely getting some human interaction to some degree. All right, that's a lot. Let's uh, take a cute animal break. Five or 10 seconds of cute animals. Oh, look how cute that animal is. Oh, don't you feel so much better? <laughs> 
Now I need to really quickly harp on a specific strain of flu that I've mentioned in the past, and that is H7N9. It's one of the CDC's top contenders for the next pandemic, and it has what appears to be a 30 to 40% case fatality rate, which is just mountains above what COVID is. This is an avian or bird flu that appears to also, as this study says, not rapidly adapt in pigs. So we're talking some of our main farm animals. And as the WHO says, as we've observed those cases in humans, it doesn't appear to spread from human to human rapidly yet. So obviously other flus are able to do that. We need to just keep it from getting to that point. So it's clear that animal agriculture is the main point of contact between humans and animals that could give us diseases. And don't get me wrong, John didn't like not mention this or completely ignore it. I just feel like it was downplayed in comparison to wildlife. And the blame was pretty much entirely put on factory farms. He was more or less like on British factory farms. And America is actually ground zero for another dangerous practice here, factory farming. It's something that started here, but has since skyrocketed around the world to the point that factory farms now supply more than 90% of meat globally and 99% of meats domestically. In factory farms, livestock are bred and confined in ways that can enable viruses to spread among them much more easily. Well, I'm obviously fervently against factory farms. This was a bit of a cop out and it's so farms. And the first one comes down to something that happened before factory farms were developed in the you know 1950s or 1960s in the US. And that is the 1918 flu, also known as the Spanish flu, just because Spain was reporting on it the most. However, as this paper mentioned, the most likely origin of this was a Kansas chicken farm. Oops, so the most lethal flu in human history that killed at the very least 16 million people happened before factory farming existed when the global population was less than a quarter of what it is today and the meat consumption per person was lower. So for the sake of argument, we could be eliminating factory farms, massively reducing meat consumption and still engineer a virus equivalent to the most lethal virus in human history. See how this isn't quite doing enough? And you are fine with keeping the current meat consumption. And now as tired of COVID as we all are, we have to talk about the origin of the virus behind it. And yeah, well, it's probably emotionally satisfying to say, oh, it was created by some evil group of individuals, some cabal in some lab or just let free on purpose. It might be emotionally satisfying to think that uh, the data just does not support it. And this paper in Nature Medicine outlines the genetic argument for that. Also, we didn't need top secret labs to create that long list of zoonotic diseases I mentioned before. Uh, we don't need it today to create viruses like SARS-CoV-2. So let's get to the natural origin. And John spent a lot of his video focusing on bats, you know, tourists going into a bat cave and getting pooped on and things like that. That's horrible. And not just the disease parts, just the very concept of this walk-in bat toilet being a tourist destination. And I agree that people need to stay away from bats. They're basically little virus kitchens, but there's usually another animal that acts as the virus door dash. There's a middle animal that we usually come in contact with that gives us the virus that the bat was making or remixes the virus that the bat was making. And that is why the going theory, the main one still is bat to pangolin to human, again, not proven. Now there are larger gaps in the bat to human avenue than there is in the pangolin one. And that brings me to this study. They looked at the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2 in bats, which is RATG13, as I like to call it rat G13 and they found that it can't bind to human cells yet the closest coronavirus in pangolins can bind to those human ACE2 receptors pretty dang well and I have to say if pizza rat had a SoundCloud rap handle it would be rat G13 rat G13 I'm a rat I love pizza I'm a rat drag a slice through the subway I hate mice my subway the sandwich shop I hate cops and pangolins are the most trafficked mammal in the world, but there was no mention of the pangolin throughout John Oliver's video. However, it is again eaten for its meat 
as a delicacy, as well as some Chinese medicine scale stuff, which is ridiculous. But another great point that was made on Last Week Tonight by John is that the more that we commit habitat destruction, the more we encroach on the habitat of these animals, the more likely those viruses are to come into the human sphere. Over 30% of new and emerging diseases are linked to deforestation and land use change. And on this topic, John even covers Amazon rainforest destruction. Take the Amazon. Studies have documented that clearing patches of forest appears to create the ideal habitat along forest edges for the type of mosquito that's the most common transmitter of malaria there. But completely failing to mention that 80% or possibly more of rainforest destruction is a direct result of cattle ranching, of people wanting to eat cows. A lot of grazing, which is not factory farming, still creating that exact same issue. And to zoom out to the whole world and show how much of a issue this is directly connected to meat consumption, we have to talk about species extinction. We're just hitting on all, all of the lovely topics here today. And that brings me to this study, which pins human carnivory, as they call it, or eating animals, meat, as likely the leading driver of species extinction, citing things like habitat loss and so on. So this is a land use issue, and there is no single larger use of land than livestock at approximately 30% of our ice-free land. And in the US here, it's about half of the lower 48's land in its entirety. But this brings me to the question of why he didn't push the meat point, which was so obvious, which all of the information they had was so obvious. He, I mean, he mentioned it, he just didn't recommend it. And I think that has to do with a few things. I think he tends to like to present his audience with a sort of emotionally satisfying conclusion and most people eat meat and I'm sure that him and most people on his writing staff also eat meat, so it would have been kind of hard for them to recommend stopping or almost stopping eating meat. So that would have required a major look in the mirror, and this brings me to a perfect parallel to this, how doctors who are overweight or obese themselves are about 40% less likely you know, to discuss weight management with their patients. So that's pretty telling. Now, it could have at the very least been like, I know you don't want to give up meat, but we kind of have to do it, look at all this information. And that brings me to what one of my Patreon contributors, shout out to Sarah, mentioned to me. And that was, of course, the fact that his previous colleague or boss, not sure, John Stewart, previous host of The Daily Show, is a vegan. So at least John Stewart would have given it to you straight. And I think that maybe they should have a conversation about this. Anyway, moving on to those solutions that I think are either not good enough or wouldn't do much at all. It goes without saying, don't go into poopy bat caves. I think we can all agree on that. It's also great to have more funding for public health. I mean, I'm most of the way through a master's in public health. Obviously, we need more money in this field. And yeah, it's gonna help to have some more reporting on sick animals in farms, but the reality is, once you're reporting it, that new disease already exists if it has evolved. So you're only, again, putting a Band-Aid on it and you're not preventing it from happening in the first place. And the way to prevent it is to lower the amount of animals. And that brings me to the implied solution about factory farming. Factory farming is bad, so we need to stop factory farming. Well, as I explored in my recent regenerative grazing debunked video directly from the industry funded study, shifting over to that type of like pastured system, as they say, uses two and a half times as much land, which I then calculated based off our world and data figures that that would take up 95% of our habitable surface on earth to shift our food system over this way. And now that you know what the issue with habitat habitat destruction and land use is. Uh, clearly, that is not a solution that's gonna prevent pandemics. Solutions that would, would be to shift our protein sources over to things like legumes and faux meats and even cultured cell-based meats, whatever you wanna call them. You know, those literally are animal meat and there's virtually zero risk of diseases. There's certainly no risk of new diseases. Perhaps there's some way to get some contaminated, but it's gonna be virtually zero risk. And as for those plant-based faux meats, as I always like to mention, you can, you can see videos of them tricking people into thinking that they are actually animal flesh. So clearly the taste is getting there. People just mentally need to get there. I would say right. A is a, that's meat, is meat. B is the fake burger. B is the real, bur real burger. A is the impossible burger. That is insane. <laughs> Isn't that insane? In the end, well, the stopping of eating meat is probably the single biggest individual thing that you can do right now to help prevent the next pandemic. 
John Oliver and his team just kind of made people feel good about continuing business as usual. Really, we just need to lower the amount of animals that are used and eaten by humans, which will lower the direct risk from them. And then of course the risk of a wild virus entering, emerging into the human sphere through our misguided land use. And finally, yes, factory farming needs to stop. We need to shrink those farms. But even then we had the 1918 pandemic from farms that were not factory farms, so we need to do even more. And I just have to add the point there that it's not just exotic viruses in Asia created in a far off land from weird exotic animals that you don't eat. Remember, 1918 was on a US chicken farm, chicken being the most consumed meat in the US. So you're not off the hook. Again, I think John Oliver and his team did great in one aspect, but missed a massive opportunity and potentially did some damage in the other aspect. So let me know what you think about that down below. Is there maybe a better, bigger way to prevent the next pandemic? And don't just say kill all humans. <laughs> all right, feel free to like and subscribe and definitely try and get notifications going because my views have gone down by about 50% probably as a result of notification things. So please get that going so I don't have to quit YouTubing. Bye.